Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Father Basil Nortz, who is a member of the Order of Canons Regular of the Holy Cross. He's preached for retreats for members of the Opus Angelorium around the United States. He is the prior of the Monastery of the Holy Cross. With Father Basil Nortz, we go inside the pages of Holy Silence, a practical guide to recollection in God, published by Sophia Institute Press. We now begin part two of our conversation. Would you say that our use of the memory, as you said, is so key to what we're going to experience in this Eucharistic revival? It is very essential that that type of holy remembrance but it's not just, as you said, something static and reflected on the past, but it's something that's happening right now. It's in the present moment. Yes, yes. And actually, I mean, there's a, I mentioned in the book, another sense of memory, the liturgical memory, which is a efficacious memory in the sense that when our Lord said, do this in memory of me, he was not simply telling us to remember in our minds, but to celebrated in such a way that that event of the Last Supper and his also his death and crucifixion and death on the cross becomes actually present in the present and through the liturgical memory. So this is a technical term and used in liturgical theology where through the celebration of the liturgy, our remembering of these events makes them actually present to us here and now. And so it's, as you say, it's to be present to the present moment, but to see how all the the works of God's saving grace become applied to what we are dealing with in our daily life. I mean, so the idea is that the liturgy should penetrate all the different challenges that we're faced with on a day-to-day life by making those graces present to us in our day-to-day life. Father, I think one of the areas that we have to be very mindful of, and I'm so glad you bring it up in the book, is the silence of interior conversations. Interior prayer is a good thing, and conversing with God, as Teresa of Avila said, talk to him like a friend. But there's also a lot of stuff that happens in maybe conjunction with our imagination or whatever that might be. But that interior conversation is something we have to try to silence as well, often, don't we? Yes, it is the case that I mean, a person can go into perhaps an adoration chapel where everything exteriorly is silence, but although they're in the presence of our Lord and they're there to adore him, they spend the time thinking about what they're going to say to their husband or their wife or their neighbor when they get home. And so they go through a rehearsal of those conversations. So it's that's the noise. It's a kind of noise that's can it's very common noise. And so the idea of prayer is to elevate our, our heart and our mind, our conversation to our Lord. And so these kind of conversations are obviously distractions from prayer. And so this capacity that we have to have this type of conversation, to imagine conversing with someone in our mind, even when we're alone is a very great grace that God has given to us exactly to allow us, enable us to be able to pray anywhere, anytime, interiorly. Because the moment that we make that act of the will interior, act of the will to say something in our mind to God or to Mary, to the guardian angel, they can hear it. They actually are able to hear those inner voices when we direct our will we, we want them to hear it. God can always hear everything. He's, uh, he knows everything. As far as the angels and the saints, normally we need to allow them to hear what's going on. I mean, you can actually make a habitual act of the will. It's possible to, to pray a prayer saying, 
for the guardian angel, I want to give you habitually the permission to see everything I'm thinking about <laughs> and to open up our mind to him so that, that it will only be for him. So the guardian angel can know what's going on so that he can help guide us better to he see if he knows notices that we're thinking about nonsense, he can try to intervene. He can try to but in any case, in the normal way, yeah, this these inter interior conversations are good when they are directed to holy people who can actually hear them. But there are distractions when they're just rehearsing conversations that nobody can hear at the that particular time. Uh, yeah, I am always grateful for that acknowledgement of our guardian angels and for those saints that we have such wonderful friendships with, as well as that communication with our Lord, because it means we're not alone. That the, the very real importance of understanding that we are not in isolation, because the enemy would want you to feel that way, wouldn't he? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what he wants us to feel. He wants us to feel that we're we're all alone and there's nothing we can there's nobody around that can help us. But that's that's a lie. We know that to be a lie. Mm. That getting ourselves prepared for that prayer, that's something that the the saints have passed on. I'm thinking of a particular Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the importance of our posture, our taking in some scripture that essentially creating in that interior space the environment for that interior conversation. Yes, yes. I mean, indeed, we need to prepare ourselves to have, to, for a time, a formal time of prayer, it's important that we really consciously place ourselves in the presence of God, and it's good to have some sacred scripture, some passionate passages inspired by the Word of God. But yeah, it takes some real effort to begin well prayer. Because it can be affected by what what you term in, the, in those 12 steps, the, the silence of the heart. Because the heart, that's the where the emotions are. That's where we experience the angers and the frustrations and the, so many of the appetites and so many of the different types of things. And that is very, at least for me, you know, oftentimes is very disruptive to having that silence. Yes. And that is, again, another great challenge of trying to have a certain control or dominion so, uh, uh, on our different emotions and not allowing them to rule our right reason, but allowing right reason to rule them. But it sets the whole challenge of particularly the virtues of temperance and fortitude, because these are what are the means by which we really overcome impatience and an excessive fear or anger or other attractions that that are just distractions from our proper goal. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a very challenging thing, but it's, again, possible. Everything is possible with the grace of God if we, again, the idea of the book is to help call attention to different areas where we try to examine ourselves on a regular basis so that we can be more vigilant in each of these areas. Well, when you talk about the importance of grace, especially in these areas of the emotions and of self-love and a number of other things that are brought up in the, the other steps, the other pieces of the silence, that grace can be attained more fully through the sacrament of reconciliation, can it? I mean, in your attempt to practice the silence, there are so many ways that you can receive help. It's not something you can just sit down and go, okay, I'm the step one, step two, step three. I mean, it, it takes work, doesn't it? Yes, it takes work, but as you point out, a very important is the, the principal means of grace are the sacraments. And so particularly those sacraments that we can repeat, the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Confession are very important means of advancing in these different types of silence because we don't just examine our conscience in order to try to use our own effort to advance, but we examine our conscience in order to present 
our failings to our the divine physician, our Lord, and He can give us the necessary helps, spiritual helps, in order to for us to go on with greater strength in the future. I think the silence of self love is again very important because we are to understood that we are beloved children of God, and and we do we have to to love the fact that of who we are and the fact that God loves us so much that we're here and that he he desires a relationship with us but there's another aspect of self love that is can be very very damaging can it yes yes and so God, as in all the silence types of silence there's always a true form and then a counterfeit form. And so with self-love, there is obviously, our self-love is the foundation of our relationship with our neighbor, because we have to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But it's also foundational for our relation with God. And it's also, it's, it's, it's based upon our awareness that God loves us. God loves us with an infinite, a uh, love that we can't even begin to uh, imagine how great his, his love is for us. And that gives us the security to to pursue the true our true good. So that's the idea of the silence of self love is the silence of that false self love. So the silence of the pursuit of of affirming ourselves by being rich and famous and and powerful in the world and so on. These are illusions that are false self-love whereas the true self-love is that it's it's rooted in our relation with God and our our pursuit of holiness and Christ are being members of Christ's mystical body where he wants to work marvels through us as members of his mystical body and so that's proper vision of our self-love whereas the worldly sense of self-love that seeks to fill itself with emptiness of the world is something that's obviously very distractive, but also destructive. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts.
We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Father Basil Nortz about his book, Holy Silence, A Practical Guide to Recollection in God. The silence of the Spirit, I think that's very, very important, too. And, and he, as you said, that the full refinement of our spirit is brought to perfection through what we are called passive purifications, in which we abandon ourselves more exclusively to God's activity. Is that, and we desire His will more so than our own, correct? Yes. Yeah. So there's also, so there's the danger of trying to plan out our, to create for us ourselves a, an image of what it will look like to be a saint. I mean, if we create our own image of what God will just laugh at it and he'll give us something completely different because he has his plans that surpass our understanding. And so the idea of the silence of the spirit is to really learn a docility to God's providence and his plans, the way he wants to lead us. And it's exactly the passive purifications are a way of, I guess say, erasing or, or putting aside our, our plans, which are very often not, not very helpful, and allowing God's plans to be, be realized in us. So it's, it's, a, so it's a, an abandonment to God's providence is a part of this, a fundamental part of the silence of spirit. Now, achieving the silences, and as you reflect on what you just spoke of, Father Basil, that that desiring God's will over our own it can entail suffering. I mean, we see that in the agony of the garden, so much so that our Lord would sweat blood. Sometimes to achieve the silences will we have to acknowledge can be moments of suffering inside of us. Yes, and that's the, I mean, it's the foundation of our Christian faith and the symbol that symbolizes our Christian faith is exactly the cross. It's something that's the way to true greatness, the true measure of greatness that, we, that God presents to us is the measure of love but a love so great that is willing to give ourselves for our neighbor, for the service of God and his church. And it, yeah, it, for us to be able to do that means a, a real mortification of our natural tendencies, our natural inclinations. And that involves this kind of, kind of suffering, a renunciation. God knows our measure. He knows what we are able to realize at any given point. He's very prudent, and we have to be also very prudent in the sense that we you know, have these ideas of somebody reading a life of the saints and says, well, I'm going to do that. And he tries to imitate some heroic action, but it's something that's just too much for that person at that time. You have to take baby steps. And that's the idea of the confidence that God will show us the next step. He won't show us the big picture always, but he'll just, what is the next step? And we have to be open in the idea of silence, to be open to recognize and accept that next step. And, and that's the part of the silence of spirit, is to have, maintain that openness. I think the silence of judgment is about as hot a topic, if you touch it, it can kind of, woof, wow, it's an area in which today everyone has an opinion, everyone has a thought, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it requires a great deal of the, the queen of the virtues, humility and temperance potentially, to try not to get caught up, especially when it is fueled, that fire is fueled, fueled by our current media culture. Yes. Exactly. The information that we have at our fingertips allows us to become backseat drivers or how do you say, just experts on <laughs> all kinds of topics without really having to make any effort. But we're not directing as a the humility that's necessary to recognize the limitations and not to insist so much 
our opinions, we have to insist upon our faith, which is not an opinion. The faith, supernatural faith is a sure knowledge. It's a certain to, certitude. And so these are the things that we have to have a certain strength to know that I mean, the truths of sacred revelation and the teachings of the church. But when it comes to more down to, I mean, more concrete matters of day-to-day life, we have to have a great deal of humility. And particularly when we find ourselves tempted to pass judgment on the interior motivations of another person, that's where it becomes particularly necessary to practice a great deal of humility and not readily condemn, because that's where our Lord very, and St. Paul are very clear that the moment that we begin to judge in a very with a harsh judgment another person, we are condemning ourselves in a certain way because we ourselves are guilty of similar things. So yes, the silence of judgment is very important. It's very challenging. I want to, if I could, just take that particular chapter and just post that everywhere for people's reflection. I think if every single aspect of Holy Silence, a practical guide to recollection and God, is important. And I think it's essential in the spiritual life. But the, the section on silence of judgment, boy, if I could get people and myself, I have to start with myself first, right? And then my family, and, and just to take extra time to really steep ourselves in that. And so thank you for the way that you handled it, especially when it came to the realm of faith issues and how we should enter into that recollection. Yes, yes. So particularly, yeah, to have the language of St. Ignatius of Loyola is to sentire con ecclesia, to, to have a sense for the church, but in this, the sense of the church, not simply the church today, but the church over the last 2,000 years. We have to see the church in the light of sacred tradition, the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church, that has to form our way of judging things in the light of faith. Well, Father, you've been so gracious in just allowing us the time to just even take glimpses of each of these areas of silence. And we touched upon a little bit when we were speaking of the silence of the spirit, the importance of the silence of the will, that we allow the will of God to be the most important thing that we seek. And silence is probably the one of the sure, it's probably if not the only way that we could truly get there. Yes. So I uh, said some um... So the idea of the book is to try to help have an overview of the different areas in which we can be be vigilant in our day-to-day life. And yeah, the silence of the will is one of those areas where we try to, I mean, the, the goal of our spiritual life in the end is to conform our will to the will of God. I mean, the words of Our Lady, be it done unto me according to thy word, the, that is the the goal of our true sanctity. And so there's a, yeah, it's a great challenge. One, as you speak about the silence of union, I just want to take that icon of the Blessed Virgin that's on the front of the book. I just want to get a bigger one and put it right in front of me, have it on my desk, have it in my room. I mean, especially in a place of prayer, it's such a beautiful icon of what... It, I think what we hope to become, don't don't you think? Yes, yes. And so as the the whole goal of all this, I mean, so the first 11 types of silence mentioned in the book are part of our ascetical life in the sense of that part of our spiritual life where we are trying to discipline ourselves better with help of God's grace. The silence of union is that experience that not only will come in heaven, we hope to <laughs> arrive at, but it's something to the extent that we are able to practice the silence of speech and the silence of the eyes and the body and so on, we will begin to experience an inner peace, an inner silence that the world can't take from us. It's something that, it's an experience of the love of God in our heart, which 
nobody can take from nothing, nobody can separate us from that love. When we remove from our hearts those things that are distractions from that. Well, Father Basil, again, I said it before, I am so grateful that you've brought forward this work, Holy Silence, a practical guide to recollection in God. I wish we had more time. I really do. Um, but any final thoughts? Just to, um, my hope is that people will find this book helpful for coming closer and finding a greater peace in this very challenging time in the history of humanity. So it's something that's I am I'm very grateful for being able to speak about this, and I I hope that people will find it very helpful for their spiritual life and also just their peace in Christ. Well, we're very blessed by your order and the monastery and the prayer that is flowing from it. Are there ways that people could come to know more about the Canons Regular of the Holy Cross? Well, there is a website that the order has there in the United States that gives a good historical overview. But also, the order was re-resurrected by a movement called the Work of the Holy Angels, which has, also has its own website called Opus Angelorum, which presents the spirituality within that spirituality. Of course, silence is a very important part of that. So the Work of the Holy Angels and the Order of Canons Regular Holy Cross, they both have websites that present both the history of our order and the different elements of our spirituality. Well, Father, we are so grateful for your time today. Would you be so good as to bless the listeners? Yes, yes. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, your holy guardian angels, and all the angels and saints, may Almighty God bless, strength, and protect you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. With Father Basil Norris, we've gone inside the pages of Holy Silence, A Practical Guide to Recollection in God. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.